It's happened to all of us. You go to the store, stock up on groceries, household goods. Ooh, a new candle. And it's on sale? Sure, I'll throw that in my cart. You go to check out, swipe your card, head home, settle in on the couch, and wait a second. Is that an ad for candles? In fact, that's the exact brand I just bought. How did they do that? We are able to show targeted advertising that's relevant to people. We obviously have advertising. We're an ad-supported model, but again, we collect less data than our peers. We're just allowing private companies to monitor us left, right, and center. For most people, very familiar with Meta, Facebook, and YouTube, but the successful business model of those powerful platforms has really triggered a kind of wild west, you know, digital data gold rush. At this point, data collection is a fact of life. From browser cookies and Amazon Prime to hyper-specific Facebook ads, the modern consumer is giving over more and more data every single day. But what if we told you data collection goes beyond social media, beyond e-commerce? You're collecting I, that data, what people purchase uh, online. I, yes I, I no? actually, if they share it with us. That it's more a part of your everyday life than most people realize. It's a total monetization of every aspect of our lives that we didn't ask for and that we really have very few ways to escape. What if you're giving over your valuable data the moment you step in a store? Walking into a store, there's a camera tracking my face, there's Wi-Fi or beacons tracking my movement through the store. When you go shop for groceries, the grocery store is shopping for your data. And now, the federal government might be stepping in on behalf of consumers. Imagine a futuristic city where the in-person shopping experience is completely transformed, where every billboard and bus ad is personalized just for you, where clipping coupons is a thing of the past, and instead they materialize in your hand the moment you step in front of a product. A world where a store knows exactly what you want before you even step through the door. They know your age, gender, race, what size shoes you wear, your favorite baseball team, your movie night snack preference. They can even figure out if you're pregnant. It may sound like something out of a sci-fi movie, but it's actually happening right now, in the U.S., to millions of shoppers at some of the country's biggest retailers. Retailers today are doing just about everything they can to get as much information about you as possible because that's a whole new revenue stream for them. It feels like data collection is something that we all know is happening but can't escape. A study out of the University of Pennsylvania found 79% of Americans feel they have little control over what marketers can find out about them. And over half, 52%, felt if they didn't hand over their data, they wouldn't get the discounts they want. And even worse, that same survey found the majority of Americans don't know the extent of what companies can do with their personal data. The moment you step into the store, often even before you enter the store, there's all sorts of devices and technologies that are being deployed nowadays to actually track customers and understand their behavior. In the world of data monetization, there are three major categories of data that are collected. The first is personal data. Things like birthdays, age, name, and address. The second kind of info is demographic data. Things like socioeconomic status, education, age group, and income. And third is behavioral data. These are traceable actions a retailer can collect, such as product preference, purchase history, internet browsing, and how much you're willing to pay for products. That data collected by companies directly from you is called first-party data. And retailers are sitting on troves of it. They can then turn around and sell that to a lot of different companies who are maybe using your, say, you know, Disney Plus email login in order to tie you together using that email address identifier. Now, the world of data acquisition is huge. Some may call it a kind of wild west. But for now, let's focus on retailers. How does my local supermarket get my data? There are several points where data is collected. These are called touch points or moments when you are giving over information to a company, whether it's knowingly or unknowingly. One of the biggest touch points for retailers is the most obvious one. One of the biggest culprits in retailer data collection is those loyalty programs. To sign up for one of those, you have to give your name, your date of birth, your email address, your phone number, and then subsequently you are incentivized every time you go and shop at this particular retailer to enter in all that information to identify yourself. And they're still one of the most prominent ways in particular right now that companies are figuring out how to monetize data. Every time you swipe your loyalty card to collect those points, you're being tracked, your purchase is being connected to your profile, and that data is being used to analyze your behavior further. 
Now many people opt to not use a loyalty program, saving themselves from having to hand over that information directly. But even something as simple as downloading the store's app can be a touch point. Other touch points might be happening without you even realizing. Things like geofencing, connecting to in-store Wi-Fi, even location tracking. And they definitely have cameras in stores that are watching people's bodies and which aisle they're in. And if they're getting confused with this item, they'll know to send a customer service rep. A lot of stores nowadays are using cameras with facial recognition to identify or re-identify customers. Sometimes they might even use the store Wi-Fi that even if you don't connect to, just the fact that your phone is in the store, your phone has an identifier. Macy's, Target, Walmart, even Home Depot implement location tracking in one way or another sending location-specific push notifications, implementing guided maps into their apps, and even using cameras and AI to analyze a shopper's path through a store. One of the things that I talked about was what, how Walmart has completely changed the game around how they're doing delivery. Given the geofencing uh, features, their IoT essentially inside the store wakes up, makes sure that things get packed fresh, and is really for delivery. So you've made your way through the store, got your groceries, and now it's time to check out. This is where most people assume they start to hand over their information, but they may not realize how much because retailers don't stop at name, email, and phone number. They know what you bought, what you look for. You know, they, they're able to use, uh, you know, big computers to analyze what you're willing to pay, what you're not willing to pay, when you buy it. But let's say you choose not to sign up for a loyalty program. You don't give an email or a phone number. You don't have the app. You've done everything possible to protect your data. Well, that is until you pull out your credit card. The credit card you're using or the debit card you're using is being tracked. So they know that this card has been used for a purchase in the store, even in the past, for example, and they can tie it to previous purchases. Your actual purchase data is all tied into that. So the exact items you purchased, at what price, whether you used a coupon or not, whether you got a discount or not, all of that is feeding into this sort of customer profile. But what if I pay with cash? Well, they have a plan for that too. A lot of stores will even at checkout ask you for an email uh, or ask you to, you know, scan a QR code to get a digital receipt. I'm at the checkout, I've paid, maybe I even paid with cash, but I scan a QR code, get a digital receipt in my browser, and now my device is connected to my customer uh, profile. So in just one shopping trip, you may have given a company or companies a lot more information about you and your habits than you realize. But what are they doing with it? Well, short answer is, it depends. Most data was, and still is, initially used for consumer insights. Much like social media algorithms, retailers want to bring shoppers in by tailoring the experience to consumers' wants and needs. The better I know my customers, the more I can sell to them. The better I know my customers, the better experience I can give to them. The better I know my customers, the more services I can sell to them in addition, in addition to what I do. And lastly, the better I know my customers, the more revenue I can generate. In the past, data acquisition commonly meant a company collects your information via third-party methods, like browser cookies, or buying your information from a data broker. A data broker is a company that specializes in collecting a person's information, then turning around and selling it to third parties. Axiom, Experian, and CoreLogic are examples of notable U.S. data brokers. While data brokers still play a large role in the information collecting ecosystem, retailers have started cutting out the middleman. Every company today is a data broker. Your local grocery store is a data broker. You know, you know, your drugstore is a data broker. Your retailer is a data broker. Certainly everywhere you go online, they're data brokers. In 2021, the data broker market was valued at an estimated $319 billion. That number is expected to pass $545 billion by 2028. According to PwC, retailers can expect to see a 3 to 5% margin increase by investing in data monetization. We've seen Macy's and Best Buy, Sam's Club, a bunch of companies are turning around and taking the data that they happen to know about you and making a new revenue stream out of it by selling it to other companies. By cutting out the middleman, retailers get more say on how and where their customers' data is used, opening up an entirely new revenue stream. But then that poses the question, what are retailers doing with your data? Well, the first and most obvious answer is one most of us run into every single day. A lot of data ends up being used for the targeted ads that we see every time we load a web page or scroll on our social media feed. You know, if you pay attention to the next time you load a web page, there's usually a bit of a lag between the content loading and then the ads loading. 
because in that moment, there's a huge auction happening way behind the scenes that you don't know about where people are slinging your information around. This leads into another way retailers are monetizing data, retail media networks. A retail media network is a network of advertising infrastructure that retailers offer to third parties. This could be in-store, through apps, websites, even smart TVs. Today, every you know major supermarket and retail and dollar store chain is in fact engaged in digital marketing through these retail media networks. Retail media networks set up a tit-for-tat relationship between advertisers and retailers. Advertisers get direct access to not just shoppers, but their data as well. This valuable first-party data allows advertisers to avoid using third-party identifiers, like browser cookies. And in turn, retailers offer more discounts, collect ad revenue, and narrow the gap between ad spend and sales. In 2022, the global market value of retail media networks was valued at $18.8 billion. So if I sell you a t-shirt, I maybe have a 30% profit margin on it. But if I show you an ad for Hershey's that really wants to target you because you fit a certain customer profile that they want to target, I basically have 90% margin on that because I'm basically being paid to show you an advertisement. And it's not just advertisers that are getting a slice of the data pie. Many retailers, like Walmart, provide data to suppliers. This leads into a larger conversation about company partnerships. Every company works with every other company. So your local grocery chain, for example, has partnerships, you know, a myriad, an avalanche of partnerships with platforms and data brokers and media companies and advertisers, you name it. Retailers are also partnering with brands, utilizing things like slotting fees, where brands might pay a store to be placed eye level, making a shopper more likely to pick a big brand product over competitors. This practice has evolved in the era of online shopping. The kinds of brands that you might see when you when you look at your app to get your loyalty discounts, for example, those brands have paid to be there, to re be in the forefront, paying to get access to you, but also sharing data about you in various ways. But how is this all legal? Aren't there privacy laws that protect consumers? Well, some data is protected, meaning it can't be sold, but it can be shared. They've developed a kind of technique which they think gets them around privacy laws, and it's sharing. Everybody collaborates with everyone else. Everyone partners with everyone else. So your grocery store is not selling the data. Data brokers might sell some data to grocery stores, but grocery stores are partnering with a whole bunch of companies in order to kind of pool the data. So let's say you shop at grocery store A, and grocery store A is set to merge with grocery store B. Now you've never actually been to grocery store B, but a merger would mean grocery store B would also have access to all your data. Every purchase, every card swipe, every coupon, every time you grab discount chips over a name brand. Now, let's add a third party. Say you sometimes order groceries through Mobile Shopper, and Mobile Shopper has a data partnership with Grocery Store B, meaning Grocery Store B could be getting your data from two sources without you ever having stepped foot in the store. It's not a hypothetical, it's actually happening right now between Kroger, Albertsons, and Instacart. While this may seem like at worst an inbox full of junk mail and a slight annoyance, data partnering can have huge implications when those private companies' data protections fail. What we've done over the last 25 years, basically, is allow all these big data companies and big media data companies to get bigger. And so consequently, when there is a breach, right, they have so much data, it's very hard for them to protect all that data. And it goes beyond that, because you don't need your data to end up on the dark web for it to be used against you. Once it's out there, it can be bought by insurance providers, law enforcement, banks, even the government. When you're applying for a job or applying for a loan, some of the checks that companies may do on your record can include data that you had no idea they could have access to. That's a really big concern when it comes to people's financial health and employment opportunities is what data is being used to make decisions about me? Is it data that's correct? Is it data that I have any opportunity to see and correct if it is wrong? And big box stores aren't just grocery and retail. They're also becoming pharmacists, healthcare specialists, optometrists. They know if you're on food stamps, if you're a veteran, if you're pregnant, if you have kids. So there are public health and privacy, you know, and consumer protection issues uh, that are implicated by the explosion of data uh, tactics that the grocery stores are using today.
So what can consumers do to protect themselves? Well, first, you can simply choose to opt out of many of those data sharing touch points. Taking opportunities when you can to find ways to opt out of stuff is a really powerful tool that you can have. Being very wary of loyalty programs, looking at privacy policies of different services can tell you a lot about what they intend to do with your data. If that privacy policy is really vague, then you should try your best to stay away. The ultimate way to not be tracked is to go analog, which in practical terms means when you walk into a store, you might want to turn off your Wi-Fi, put your phone into flight mode so that you're not being tracked by beacons or by the store Wi-Fi. But even then, understanding what you're agreeing to or how you can protect yourself can be overwhelming. There's a reason that the way that you figure out what rights you have regarding your data are buried on page 17 of privacy policies. Right now, this idea that you are able to opt out of data sales is kind of absurd because it would take a huge amount of your time and energy to actually locate how you're supposed to submit these requests and then actually take the time to do it. And what about my data that's already out there? Well, that's a bit more complicated. Right now, we as consumers have incredibly few legal protections around data collection. Right now, companies can pretty much collect whatever they want about us and do whatever they want. Remember that UPenn survey we mentioned earlier? Well, of the Americans surveyed, nearly 80% said Congress should act urgently to regulate how companies can utilize personal information. Despite this, consumer data privacy laws really only exist on the state level. Right now, only 13 states have passed comprehensive data privacy laws. And of those 13, only California, Colorado, Connecticut, and Virginia have laws that are currently in effect. We really need data minimization and we need purpose specification. That means that companies can't do whatever they want. And right now it's very unfortunate that industry groups, tech groups, the advertising industry has a lot of say over how those bills have looked. On the federal side, there are several data privacy laws, but they are a hodgepodge of different laws that only focus on one consumer group or one set of data. There currently isn't a singular law that focuses on consumer data protection as a whole. We can, um, as citizens in particular, ask for real regulations. We can let our lawmakers know that this system is horrific and it's just not something that we really want to even just be a part of. That's not to say there's been no movement on the federal front. In June of 2023, the FTC refiled a previously dismissed lawsuit against data broker Kochava, alleging the broker sold geolocation data that tracked sensitive info on millions of mobile devices without users' knowledge or consent. Kochava filed a motion to dismiss the complaint, calling the allegations hypothetical and says the FTC's claim is unfair. Then, in September of this year, an FTC official put out another warning shot at the data broker industry, saying the data maximization model is a serious threat to Americans' constitutional liberties, meaning we could see more action taken by the federal government against data brokers in the near future. There are many groups at risk here, you know, as these grocery stores have, you know, your health information and, you know, your ethnic racial information. So the, the, the use of all this data can have very potentially harmful and discriminatory impacts. Uh, another reason why we need regulators uh, on the case.